Morning. How's your sleep? I love sleeping, but I never want to go to sleep early. I stay up late every night, regret it every morning, and then do it all over again. That's a quote that, although comically relatable, does describe a rather dark period in my life. It might seem hyperbolic to describe one's life period through sleep, but the difference between a hellish existence and a good one can truly rest just on a good night's sleep. And if you have bad sleeping habits, which is to say that you sleep poorly, routinely, you might just be in such a bad state for so long that you've no longer noticed the fact that your day-to-day -day conscious experience is bad. And that was me for a long time. And then I came across an interview with a rich dude named Brian Johnson, who is investing millions of dollars into a personal project about health. And he singled out that just out of all the protocols that he's ever done, the single thing that yielded the most return for his health is sleep. He prioritized sleep to such an extent that virtually everything he does during the day, what he does when he wakes up, what he eats, when he eats, how often he eats, virtually all these routines that he does during the day was for the purpose of his sleep later in the day. In other words, he's not just trying to sleep when he is about to sleep, he's preparing for it the moment he wakes up. That's a different paradigm from what people usually think of when it comes to sleep. The general societal assumption about sleep, I would say, is one where we really want to live a good life. That's the priority. We want our conscious experience to be good. And we sleep because we like the good benefits that come from sleep. If I sleep well, I, I have a good day. I am more sharp and I don't suffer. So we sleep in order to live well. What Brian Johnson does is the other way around. He live in order to sleep well. He's not prioritizing as much of his conscious experience. He just used data to inform what he's supposed to do during the day in order to sleep. He literally flip the priority that most members of society subscribe to. And it's, it's refreshing to see that perspective. Personally, I wouldn't go as far as flipping the priority between sleeping and living like what Brian does. I still care about my conscious experience during the day more than sleep. And I really just want to sleep well in order to live well, not the other way around. But it does make me realize that sleep is not just some afterthought either. In order to truly solve the problem of sleep, I need to give it the priority it deserves. And I did. During the last year, I've researched and tried out many different protocols and tools. I think I finally nailed down a series of tools that I use that has drastically changed my sleep quality. And I would like to share them with you with the hope it will save you time if you are in the market for sleeping tools. Tool one, morning sunlight. The moment I wake up in the morning, I try to get sunlight into my eyes as soon as possible. And this can practically take the form of a morning morning walk. When I wake up in the morning, I just get out of the house and walk outside where the sun is shining. When our eyes meet the sunlight, the moment it does that, it starts setting the circadian rhythm for the day. It basically registers the fact that you've woken up, this is the morning, and your brain is going to think that it's going to get tired after 15, 16 hours from that moment. So if you're exposed to sunlight for the first time too late in the day, then your brain will think that that's the morning and it will make you sleepy 15, 16 hours from that point. That's obviously not not good. So expose your eyes to sunlight as early as possible. I live in a small town called Vancouver, which is known for raining for 16 months out of the 12 months of the year. And the sun is obscured by clouds, obviously, during the rain. But during the winter months, it actually comes out quite late in the day as well. It comes out 8 or 9 a.m. in the morning, whereas I wake up at 5.30 every morning. So I'm taking full advantage of our modern science and engineering to solve that problem here. Behind me is a, it's known as a SAD lamp. SAD stands for Seasonal Associative Disorder, I believe. Say something that a certain population suffer from where they become depressed in the winter months when there aren't a lot of sunlight. And this device mimics the light from the sun. And when you turn it on and stand before it and let that light into your eyes, hopefully your brain thinks that that's the real sun and set your circadian rhythm accordingly and, and gives you other mood boosting and uh, energy boosting benefits. It works well for some people. Not everyone respond to it as well as others. Personally, my brain seemed to be unable to distinguish the light coming from that device than at the real sun. So I'm lucky in that sense. But because uh, based on my research, not everyone respond as well to it. I won't make a blanket recommendation for everyone to go and 
put hundreds of dollars down to get a device like this. It, it cost me 170 uh, US dollars. I do want to bring awareness to the fact that devices like this exist. And, and if you're interested and, and it's a financially viable option for you, you might want to explore further. The second tool is early exercise. Exercising in the morning has the benefits of setting circadian rhythm as well. If you combine this tool with the previous tool and exercise outside in the morning when sun is shining, that's all the better, right? Go for a morning run uh, right after you wake up or the sun is shining, it's perfect. This might not work for everyone. For me, for one, it doesn't really work for my schedule, but on my day offs when I could exercise in the morning and I do it, I do feel quite good throughout the day. So highly recommended for those of you who uh, can logistically manage this protocol. The third tool is coffee. Coffees are awesome. Coffee gives you dopamine or it triggers a release of dopamine in your brain, which helps you focus. As you consume coffee over time, it also increases the ability for the dopaminergic neurons in your brain to bind with other dopamine. So you, you get a larger effect from dopamine with the same amount of dopamine when you drink coffee over time. So it's an awesome productivity tool. Definitely drink coffee unless you're underage, in which case I'm not sure, consult with your doctor. But the timing and the dosage makes the poison when it comes to coffee. So I've written down a protocol for caffeine timing and caffeine dosage. I'm gonna put them up on the screen here. And I'll also link a written Twitter or X post uh, in the description as well, where I have this information typed out and you can just copy it onto your notepad if you're interested. It's a protocol that I follow and it's helped me to just have my cake and eat it too. I drink coffee and I get all the productive benefits from coffee while at the same time does not sacrifice sleep in any way. The fourth tool is meal timing. This is for those of you who practice uh, intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding. I, for one, wake up at 5.30 and eat for the first time at 9.30 and stop eating around 5 p.m. If you practice intermittent fasting, it's important that you break your fast at around the same time every day. If you break your fast a bit earlier or later, it's as if you've moved to an adjacent time zone that's a few hours ahead or a few hours behind. It has to do with the important effect of meal timing in setting circadian rhythm. So even if I oversleep one day, right, if I sleep until seven, even when that happens, happens, I make sure to still break my fast at around the same time. And although I haven't found any sources that says that the time you start fasting during the day, that is the time you stopped feeding, has big effects on circadian rhythm as well, I do find that it does for me. I don't know if that's actually the, the meal timing of setting the circadian rhythm that's causing this, or is it just I was too hungry for skipping the meal or too bloated for eating too late to sleep? I'm not sure what's the causal effect of the variables here, but I do find it generally helpful for my sleep if I just start eating at around the same time and stop eating at around the same time every day. If you don't practice a time-restricted feeding, you don't have to worry about this as much. But one piece of information that is helpful for anyone, regardless of whether you practice time-restricted feeding, is to not eat anything for the first hour of waking and stop eating two to three hours before bedtime. Next tool is late artificial light. This is more of a common knowledge nowadays. Artificial lights coming from just lights in your house or you know, computer screens and phone screens have a negative effects on your sleep later that night. If you're exposed to those light, lights too late in the day, that is. And I don't have as much sensitivity to them personally, so I virtually have no protocols around it personally. But if you are particularly sensitive to artificial artificial lights late at night. You can dim those lights or restrict device usage or wear blue light blocking glasses late in the day. Those have been shown to be helpful. One interesting fact is that light coming from bonfire have no negative effect on sleep regardless of how late the exposure to those lights are. Although I'm not sure how practical it is to build a protocol around that, but if you have the infrastructure for it and you could conceivably just light your house with bonfire exclusively late at night. Let me know if any of you actually managed to do that. The last tool is late 
sunlight. Sunlight that you receive in your eyes later in the day. So sunset, essentially. It seems that the specific light composition from the setting sun does not adversely affect your sleep later that night. So this is different from artificial light. And even more interesting is the fact that it could actually help you sleep later that night and it could even help hedge against artificial light later that night. So if you are particularly sensitive to artificial lights later in the day and for whatever reason you have to stare at the computer screen, maybe you have to work late that day, but you want to sleep well, it might be useful to take an evening walk with the setting sun and expose your eyes to the light from the setting sun and then work late that night because it actually helps uh, prevent some of the negative effect of late exposure to artificial lights. Before I end the video, I want to discuss the idea of protocol adherence because up until this point, I've mentioned a couple of tools that you can schedule in your days to help you sleep. But as with any things that's good for us, humans seem to have a tendency to not do them. It is one practice to know what to do. There is another practice to actually go and do it, to adhere to the protocol that you know is good for you. And that can be more challenging to some people than others. For me, it is quite challenging. So here are two things that I use to increase my adherence to protocol. The first is to proactively expect imperfection in following protocol. Back in the day when I used to expect perfection from myself, the moment I just deviate a little bit from the protocol, I start beating myself down. And beating oneself down is very draining on your willpower. And if you keep doing it at some point, I find myself to just give up on the entire protocol. So a better way to to prevent that is to just aim for imperfection. I personally aim for 80% completion rate. I would still try to follow the protocol completely, but if I follow it to an 80%, I consider that a success. The second method for protocol adherence is iteration with adherence in mind. So I encourage everyone to iterate with everything I've talked about in this video. By iterating, I mean trying and experimenting with the methods and see how your body responds and tweak it according to your, your own physiology and habits. But in the context of adherence, I would add that you also iterate and experiment not only on what tools have the best effect for you, but what tools allows you to have better adherence. So if, if you really hate a particular tool, is it specifically challenging for you to follow a specific protocol, for instance, morning exercise, if you just not a morning person and you have low energy in the morning and it's very difficult for you to bring yourself to the gym in the morning, then just don't do it. Don't just force yourself to do something just because it's good for you, but also take into the element of how likely you are to ad adhere to that protocol and change your protocol accordingly. That's it. That's all I do for sleep. Hope that helps.